and watching the attendees, I, I in my mind, I, I found myself uh, uh, thinking I was like an auctioneer. We got 44. Can I get 45? Can I get 45? Can we get 46? Can we get 46? And then all of a sudden it went backwards from 45 to 44. I go, oh, wait, wait. The bidding is never supposed to go backwards. <laughs> All right, 30 seconds. See if we can hit that. Oh, there it is, 49. I said if we can hit that, see if we can hit that 50 mark, and then we'll... Uh... Almost there. Hanging in the balance, Brad. Just wait for someone to tip the scale. There we go. There it is. There's there's 50. We got there, Adam. So, uh, gosh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Um, we have uh, 120 people that uh, registered. We've already got 50 that are, are live attending. Um, we'll be sending out a recording. Uh, for those that are not able to uh, attend, uh, that registered and weren't able to attend, they, they will get a recording. Or for those that um, maybe have something come up unexpectedly, you have to log off you get distracted with something, um, do know that we will be, be sending out a recording. Um, certainly encourage you to stay on, on live. Um, but uh, yeah, again, thank you all for joining us for a part two of the Conic Leadership Series. Uh, I'm Brad Conic, uh, CEO of Conic Technical Talent Network. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with us, uh, well, even for those that are familiar, this will be a little bit of a, a refresher, but I do want to take just a couple minutes as, as, as the sponsor of this webinar um, to do, you know, the equivalent of a quick infomercial on, uh, on Conic um, to make sure that everyone's aware of who we are and what we do. Uh, we are a technical recruiting firm. We're based out of Minneapolis. Um, we've placed nearly 30,000 candidates uh, with companies in the Midwest and across the country. Um, basically, our areas of expertise are shown here on this first slide. Uh, we've got AEC, uh, engineering and manufacturing. Um, for those that are not familiar, AEC is architecture, engineering, and construction. So all related to uh, building systems. Um, any position that would support up into uh, these types of companies and or departments would be positions that we would fill. So for example, it could be from a two-year degree tech up to a vice president of engineering, could be from a CAD Revit drafter up to a licensed architect. Um, we fill all of these types of roles on a contract, contract to direct, and also a direct basis. So on the AEC side, um, we've got basically the architecture, engineering, and um, construction. Um, so again, all related to building systems on the architectural side, these would be Revit drafters, uh, licensed architects, job captains. Uh, on the uh, engineering side, um, as far as AEC, we'd be talking about HVAC, power and lighting designers and engineers. And then on the uh, construction side, we'd be talking about project managers, superintendents. Moving to the next slide, um, within engineering, we've got basically management level positions, uh, project managers, engineering managers. We've got product development, R&D, both designers and engineers. Uh, computer computer aided design. Um, those that would be a quick sampling on the engineering side. Um, as far as manufacturing, a quick snapshot and sort of some umbrella terms. The next slide would be basically within manufacturing if it's related to operations, quality, production, or logistics. Those would also be uh, roles that we would fill. So um, that's a quick once over on on who we are and what we do. If you do want more information on how, on how we might be able to help you, we will have our, a link to our website, which is conicnetwork.com, posted into the comments area. I noticed that my business partner, Tom, just posted it there. Feel free to click through that link um, if you would like to learn more. I think even more importantly, before we get started, what I would want everyone to know about our company is our core purpose, uh, which is to positively impact people's lives. Um, that includes our candidates, our clients, our community, and our entire network. And it was to this purpose that we decided to offer up the leadership series for 2023 at no charge to basically anyone within our network. Um, it's a seven part series. 
once a month, excluding the month of August. Um, so basically this is part two. Do the math, we've got five parts remaining after this. Uh, they're 90 minute sessions, usually about an hour, uh, a little bit more than that of, of content. And then we'll do a QA and a um, after that. So if you are available to stick around for the Q&A, please, uh, please do so. Um, Adam Carroll, who you can see here, um, I will be introducing here momentarily. Um, he will be our presenter and I'll be the facilitator for um, all of these sessions. Um, the topics basically are, are um, focused on leadership topics. They will include a framework for difficult conversations, which is what today's topic will be. Um, other uh, topics will be setting crystal clear expectations and getting others excited about them, um, engaging your team with purpose and why statements, building a successful team foundation, and crafting your next three years, the leader's secret weapon for top team longevity. So that gives you just kind of a sampling of some other topics that will be covered throughout the series for the remainder of the year. I know that me personally, I mean, now more than ever, um, I truly believe that the culture and leadership um, correspond, uh, corresponds directly to the success of an organization. So uh, very excited about today. And I definitely am, am, am as much a participant as I am a uh, facilitator. So um, before I pass things on, I'm going to cover just a couple administrative things. Um, for those of you that have not already signed up for the five remaining sessions, we will be sending a link out. You can sign up for the remaining five parts of the leadership series. So today, if the content strikes you, strikes a chord with you, if you have even one takeaway, or if it inspires you to continue your growth as a leader, I would encourage you to sign up for the remaining sessions. We'd love to have you. Um, also, during the presentation, feel free to post your questions into the question box. I will be keeping an eye on that, and I will present the questions to Adam either during the presentation when appropriate, or we'll queue them up and we'll address them during the uh, Q&A session. So like I'd mentioned earlier, please stick around for that if you can do so. Um, so now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Uh, Adam Carroll will be with us uh, today and throughout the entire leadership series. Uh, Adam is the founder of Renzo Experience. Uh, it is a leadership development and culture consulting firm based in the Midwest. Uh, Adam's worked with uh, thousands of leaders uh, to help create clarity and alignment within their organizations. Uh, Adam also has done a couple of TED Talks. Uh, one has a modest 6 million views on YouTube. Uh, so that's something if uh, you like today's presentation, you should go check that out. It's definitely worthwhile. Uh, but I do think, I think you'll enjoy Adam and the presentation today. We're excited to have him here today. I hope you all enjoy the content. And I truly hope that Conic, Conic positively impacted your lives today. So with that, Adam, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Brad, very much. Greatly appreciated. Uh, Welcome everybody. I'm I'm excited to see the number of people that are in the uh, audience today for this webinar. Clearly, this strikes a chord with folks. Um, difficult conversations are being had all the time, or maybe none of the time, in some companies, and that's part of the challenge that we're going to answer today. So I'm excited to see you all here. As Brad mentioned, um, you know this uh, part two of a seven part series. Each of the series kind of builds upon itself. So what I encourage you to do is really get on that list. I believe Tom had posted the link just up above in the chat. But when you get signed up for that, you'll get access to all of the previous recordings, as well as updates on all the, the future and upcoming sessions, which are going to be power packed and full of actionable content, just like today is. I just dropped a difficult convo framework PDF in the chat box. So if you are somewhere where you can download that, you're going to want to take uh, a minute and download that to your desktop or laptop. This will be something you'll want to use over and over and over again. And I'll share with you how we use that in the midst of this program. Um, first and foremost, what I want to start with is the difficult conversion framework is the title of this program. And it's really how to make challenging conversations easier or simple. And what I found is that most leaders have a hard time having difficult conversations. My intent is to help you uh, make that process far easier on yourself and your coworkers, your peers, even those that you're having the difficult conversation with. So this is going to be broken up into two parts. 
And the first part is really about understanding how the people on your team function. And the second part is really about the difficult conversation framework, but it leverages the first part. So just so you know how that breaks down, we'll spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes in each and then break into Q&A here at the end, which will be really important to stick around for. So I had a leader. One thing, Adam, uh, this we can just a, jump in. Adam, yep. we can just jump in for one more minute, then I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my, my camera and, and mute myself. I'll only pop on, sure. Adam, if I see a pertinent question that, that I want to get addressed immediately. I do want to just clarify for everyone, Perfect. if you joined late, um, if you have questions, post them in the Q&A section. I know at the bottom you'll see a chat and a Q&A. I just want to differentiate. Make sure you push them over to the Q&A area. I'll keep an eye on that. And then again, as appropriate, I'll jump on and we'll, we'll address them in the midst of the presentation. Otherwise, we'll queue them up for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So uh, with that, I'll... Uh, I'll All right. Thank you, Brad. So uh, I had a mentor one time who told me that when all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And for some of you, you've probably experienced leadership that feels like a hammer. These are people who know the answer. Just ask them. Uh, they treat things almost in a dictatorial fashion, right? And everything, whether it's easily handled or not, typically comes off the same way. You may have another group of leaders that they want all the data, they want the facts, they take their time in making decisions. Even having difficult conversations is a long, prolonged, delayed process. Then you have some that maybe their hammer is more uh, a very soft approach. Uh, they would actually much rather let things just kind of sweep under the rug and things tend to work themselves out. You know, you have leaders like that. And then last but not least, you'll have ones that are very attack oriented. Um, so know this, that no matter what kind of leader you are or you are dealing with, some of them may be approaching problems or challenging situations, conversations in the exact same way every single time. Question, Brad? <laughs> yeah, I said I wasn't going to interrupt you, but here I go again. Um, we had a couple people point out that the, I think you sent a link for the PDF. Yes. That did not go through. Uh, people are, they don't have access to it. So if we can try to repost the, what I think was referred to as the handout. Yep. Here is, so what I'll do two things. Um, I'm going to, it's not entirely um, critical that you have it in front of you right now. So what we will do is we'll put it in the email that will follow up to this, to the webinar yeah. to make sure that everyone has it. Okay, um, perfect. But we will make sure that that difficult conversation, um, and it may be towards the end, we can try and re-upload it to the chat to make sure that it shows up okay. there. Okay, yep. yep, sounds good. That's great. Thank you for that, Brian. So here is the, um, by and large, what happens. Three out of four people with whom you work, they work differently from you when in groups. They plan differently when they're with others. They're motivated for different reasons. They differ in willingness to take risks. They make use of time differently. They make decisions differently. They manage tasks differently. And the easiest way to point this out is there are folks in your office currently that the first thing they do when they show up to the office, assuming that y'all are going to the office, is they go right to the coffee pot and then they make their rounds and they say hello to everyone and they do a little, uh, how was the weekend and how was the spring break trip? And they do some you know, glad handing, if you will. Building relationship is important for them. You have another group that they come into the office, they go right to their desk and they start working on that to-do list immediately. That is one small difference, differentiator in how people operate. And a lot of this, what I'm sharing with you, um, you may be familiar with the idea of the golden rule, treat others as you'd wish to be treated. But there's a new rule and the rule that is sort of up and coming and being more in vogue right now is the platinum rule. And the platinum rule is treat others as Treat others the way they wish to be treated, the way they wish to be treated, not the way you wish to be treated. And so what's critical is we have to understand who is actually at the table with us. We use a model called Social Styles, which was put out by a company called Traycom out of St. Louis. This company has been doing research since the 1970s. And the way that I would describe this, many of you are probably familiar with the DISC profile or Enneagram or Myers-Briggs. Right, you know that you're an INFJ or an ENTJ. 
But once you know you're a high I or a low C, it doesn't really help a lot of people. I mean, it's it's hard to say, oh, I'm an ENTP, and for you to know exactly what that means or how to deal with someone. So I'm going to show you a, a model here, this quadrant idea that breaks it down into the most simple format possible. There's an x-axis and a y-axis. The x-axis you'll notice says ask on one side, ask, listen, and tell talk on the other. And the way I want you to understand this is this is speed. So the ask, listen side is slow and the tell talk side is fast. So I want you to think about someone that you know fairly well in your peer group at the office. And I want you to determine, do you experience them as slow or as fast? And I'm going to make a broad generalization here, but I'm going to say that engineers, generally speaking, uh, maybe architects, we could lump a whole bunch of people into this, right? But they're, we experience them as slow because they may be more cerebral. They ask a lot of questions. Um, maybe there's less eye contact for them. So we would experience them in the ask, listen side of the X, X axis. The tell talk oriented folks are quick decision makers. They, uh, they move fast, they talk fast, they make decisions fast. And we know those folks because we experience them as fast, right? So that's the X axis. And what I want you to do is just place yourself. Would you consider yourself more on the slow side or more on the fast side? And by the way, there's no derogatory uh, notion implied to slow or fast, okay? So are you slow or are you fast? I want you to determine that first off. Then what happens is we have to measure ourselves based on the Y axis. And the Y axis I like to describe as temperature. So if you are controlled and task oriented at the top of the page, you are experienced as more cold, right? And if you are down towards the bottom side of the Y axis in the emotive and relationship section, you would be experienced as warm. So again, going back to this person you're thinking about on your team, do you experience them as fast, you know, fast or slow, and then warm or cold? And what happens is someone who is experienced as fast and cold, they would be in the upper right-hand quadrant. If you're looking at me, it's probably over here. The upper right-hand quadrant is the driver quadrant. The drivers are a high D in the disc profile. Um, I can't tell you what they are on the Myers-Briggs, but you'll know these people because they know the answer, just ask them, right? These are the bosses and leaders who, when you go in and you say, hey boss, can I get like seven or eight minutes of your time? At seven and a half minutes, they start looking at their watch saying, you said seven or eight, it's at seven and a half. How much more time are you going to need, right? You might also hear from this group, why are people crying? There's no crying at work, all right? So, and I say that someone in jest, but also very true. Drivers have a very specific way of handling conflict. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. If you are experienced or someone experiences you or you experience someone else as warm and fast, what that means is the emotive relationship side is very important, but you're a tell talk oriented person. You're in the expressive category, which is I believe down here, if I'm looking at the mirror image, uh, the expressive category, right? They are prone to attack and confront a problem. So they might be offended in the moment and say, how dare you say that? Or I can't believe you said that in the meeting. And they're, they, they're prone to immediately go after whatever the challenge is right? And that tends to be their leadership style. They're very bright. Um, if you want to consider a bird for each of these, the driver is the eagle, the expressive is the peacock, okay? Then we move over to the amiable category. These are people that we experience as warm and slow. And warm and slow people, their core orientation is consensus. They want to make sure that everyone feels good. And if you're in that amiable category and someone says, where do you want to go to lunch? Your response is probably like, wherever, it's fine, I don't care, you choose, right? And so the amiable category tends to defer from conflict. They want to avoid it to a certain extent because they really want peace in their world. They don't wanna be things, they don't want things to be interrupted or the apple cart to be upset. They wanna make sure everyone has a say in what's going on, right? So if you experience someone as warm and slow, one of the things that I will give you as a secret is, you wanna make sure you ask them, how was your weekend? How are things? How are the kids? How's the new puppy? Uh, what are you doing for fun? What are you doing at your house these days? Ask them lots of questions and build that rapport with them. And then last but not least, those who you experience as cold and slow, 
are in the analytical category. Now, I will give a disclaimer. I'm married to an analytical woman, and she will often say, I don't want to be cold and slow. <laughs> and so, again, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just when people experience you, they might experience you as cold, meaning less emotive, and slow, meaning you take your time to process things, right? Your emails might be paragraphs long. Um, when you tell a story, it may be laden with details that are not all that important to the end result of the story. Um, these folks also have a way of handling conflict, and their way of handling conflict is they avoid it at all cost. And we're going to talk about how to do that individually. So here's what I'd like to do. We've, I've just given you a really brief primer on this, and there's obviously tons more information about social styles online. You can find it on YouTube. Um, but what I want to tell you is, if you get really good at just determining, how do I experience this person? Am I experiencing them as warm and fast, warm and slow, cold and fast, cold and slow? You'll know where they fall in, in each of the quadrants, and you'll know better how to deal with them in conflict, right? So here's what happens to these styles under stress. And this is where it becomes really critical to understand for your teams. As I mentioned, the analytical will avoid and withdraw. So if there is conflict, an analytical leader, or if you are an analytical leader, you may find yourself sort of reverting back to your office, closing the door, uh, you know, avoiding that situation until you think it all through. It's a very cerebral process, right? My wife and I, when we have arguments, she just needs time and space. You know, she'll say, I can't have this argument right now. And I'll say, well, how much time do you need? And she'll say, I need at least two hours. And then I'll look at my watch and say, okay, it's 1123. At 123, we're going to have this conversation. So analyticals will typically avoid withdrawal. A driver, contrarily, will command and take over. So if you are a driver who is under stress or you have a driver on your team under stress, they will come in and take over. Here's what we're gonna do. This is how, how we're gonna approach this step by step by step. And you're gonna take this piece and you're gonna take this piece. They become almost like the drill sergeant, very dictatorial authoritarian. Um, the expressive, as I mentioned, is prone to attack and confront. So in the attack and confront mode under stress, these people who are normally very affable and fun might actually get kind of stern and tense with people. And you'll know when they're there because they're acting differently. They're not lighthearted and loose about it. They're actually getting kind of agitated. Um, and so you'll know when that conversation needs to happen. And we'll talk about how to, how to deal with them. Last but not least, we have amiables who will acquiesce and go along. So if you are warm and slow, right? If I experience you that way, or you have a person on your team, you experience that way. And they say, well, that's fine. That's fine. What do you know? Deep down, I can almost hear you all say it. You know, it's not fine. Someone who says, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Deep down, it's not fine, but under stress, they will acquiesce and go along. Uh oh, I see Brad coming back. Maybe not. Okay. So here's the magic of this. The, the, each of these, these styles under stress will go through a Z pattern. So before I get to that, Brad, you have a question? Yeah, there was a question posed that I think is, is perfect to just interject here because I think a lot of people might be thinking this. Just confirming, um, but the question is, is it possible to move around the quadrants or at least not to be 100% driver, for example? It's a great question. And what I would say is that most people have a primary... Uh, they have a primary style that they typically live in, but it's, but for great leaders, and this is really critical, great leaders will actually bounce from quadrant to quadrant. So if you were someone listening that's saying, I don't really know where I would fall 51% of the time per se, the good news is if you are close to the center, you might bounce from driver to analytical or analytical to expressive, making you actually a really effective leader. So you may know some people excuse me, that are more chameleon-like. They can blend in in any situation. Those people probably are very close to the center and they can flex from one style to another relatively easily. Um, that is a mass massive skill set for leaders today that are looking at dealing with, with conflict. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I will say this too. This is less like a personality profile and more about observable patterns of behavior. 
right? So you know that certain people are going to do certain things under stress just based on what their style is. Um, and my a good friend of mine has a PhD in psychology, and he'll often tell me, Adam, behavior is multifaceted, multi-causal, and multidimensional. We have no idea why people do what they do, but patterns are present. People will go into certain patterns, and if we become very observant of those as leaders, we can handle our folks in a really effective manner. So one last piece on this, and then we'll move into part two about the difficult conversations. Each of these styles has four levels of stress that they go through. So when we go through the four levels of stress, we actually do a Z pattern through each of the other styles, meaning an analytical who typically avoids and withdraws. If they are in their fourth level of stress, they go through a Z pattern. You can see the, the arrow going across the chart. They become expressive. They will actually attack and confront. And this is where some of those difficult conversations need to be had. And I'll bring this up as an example when we get to that section here in a moment. But an analytical who typically avoids and withdraws immediately attacks and confronts in a meeting, what we know is that person is under tremendous stress. And we need to pull them aside and have a conversation with them that may be somewhat difficult, um, but it will be extremely enlightening once we have it. Similarly with the driver, a driver who is used to saying, this is what's going to happen. Here's how we're going to handle this next. When they go through their Z pattern, they become amiable. And a driver that says, whatever, whatever, I'm, it's fine, it's fine. And they'll say it just like that, it's fine, whatever, fine. You know that that driver is at their fourth level of stress. An expressive who typically attacks and confronts will avoid and withdraw. They'll be like, I'm out, can't even deal with it, okay? And an amiable who acquiesces and goes along, they go through their four, four levels. They do a Z pattern to driver. And if an amiable who typically acquiesces and goes along is banging on the desk telling you, here's how it's going to be, it is about to get real in that room, okay? So just know, this is important to note, these amiables typically would have to be really stressed to get up there. So when I said, when all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, one of the things I want you to take away is identifying what is your core social style and who are the styles of those around you. And when we go through this as a program with companies, what we often do is have them map who is sitting in which social style typically, because it changes the way we interact that with them when there is a challenge, because the way that they want to be communicated with is different. Remember I said three out of four people with whom you work, they communicate differently. They make decisions differently. They use time differently. And remember the platinum rule. We want to treat others the, wish, the way they wish to be treated, not the way we wish to be treated, but the way they wish to be treated. So the social styles framework, you know, are you warm and slow, fast and cold? That helps us identify how we do that. So let me share with you what is next in this process. Would you all agree and I just want a, a, a yes or a no, a why or an N in the chat box. Would you all agree that there is a difference between tension and conflict? Would you all agree with that? If you don't mind, just drop in chat here. And I'm going to stop my share just for a moment so I can see the whole screen and see what everyone's saying here. Lots of yeses. All yeses, in fact. Someone who said yes, if you would, just give me a quick snippet of what is a main difference between tension versus conflict? How would you define it? What would you say that difference is? If you don't mind, just drop a quick answer there in the chat box to let me know what that is. What is a main difference between conflict and tension? This is a great answer. Chad said, tension is like an underlying current. It's almost, and, I, and I'm gonna feel this I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that I know what you mean, Chad, but you can feel it. It's like this underlying current going through a room where you just know there's tension, but no one's talking about it. Tension is more like cues. Conflict is obvious. This is great. Uh, tension is unresolved. Conflict, even better. Uh, tension is okay and expected. Conflict happens when tension goes unchecked. Very astute. The point of view they're coming from, their consciousness is tension. This is a great perspective. Passive emotion versus an active interaction. I am totally stealing some of these, by the way, y'all. These are great. Uh, tension equals feeling, conflict equals action. All of these are awesome. So all great answers. Tension is like a bubbling lava pit. Conflict is the eruption. Ooh, this is just the visuals y'all are creating are amazing. 
Okay, so let me talk about these and then we'll talk about how we deal with them. So there is a big difference between conflict and tension. I believe tension, just like some of you said, is that feeling, it's that unresolved something that's going on. And conflict is actually locking horns, if you will, and having it out. Now here's, I'm gonna make a very broad brush statement. I think that there is tension existing in most corporations today. And the result of, the result of that tension is from unproductive conflict. There is, there is a lack of unproductive, I'm sorry, there is a lack of productive conflict, right? So when there is a lack of productive conflict, tension exists. So tension happens. I didn't understand what you said. Maybe my expectations weren't clear. By the way, next month's session is all about setting crystal clear expectations. It will blow your mind in a good way. Um, so tension occurs when Brad or Tom had an expectation of how this was going to go down and it didn't go down that way. And deep down, there maybe is some unresolved tension behind that. Whereas what we need to have is productive conflict. This is the way I, this should have happened, right? So productive conflict actually is a really good thing. In fact, Patrick Lencioni, the author of Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he said that one of the core dysfunctions of teams today is their inability to have productive conflict. People can't just go into a room and have it out and then part amicably. And that ultimately is what we're going to try and do, but do it in a very specific framework. Okay. So remember, I want to know how do you handle conflict based on what you believe your social style to be? Analytical, driver, amiable, expressive. Do you attack and confront? Do you avoid and withdraw? Do you command and take over? Do you acquiesce and go along? Now, the difficult conversation you need to have what is their social style and how do they function under stress? Because I'll paint you a picture. I'm a driver, let's say, and I command and take over and I need to have a difficult conversation with my amiable employee who I feel like is taking on too many projects. They're saying yes to everyone because candidly that group has a hard time saying no. And so I'm gonna charge into that person's office and say, I think you're saying yes to too many people. You need to be saying no more. And here's the problem that it's causing. And what will happen is that person will say, oh gosh, you're right, I'm sorry, I need to be doing this better. But then they sit and they feel like you're mad at them for the next two days or so, right? Again, I'm painting with very broad brushes, but this happens in companies today. And if that driver took the advice I'm about to give you to heart and approached that situation differently, it would create a drastically different scenario from a culture perspective, right? And here's what I want you to know. Peter Drucker said, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. If the culture of your company is not intact, then the strategy be damned, right? Uh, the way I like to say it is people don't leave companies, they leave people, right? Think about jobs that you've had in the past and why you've left. It's not because the company doesn't share your vision necessarily. Again, I'm making some assumptions here, but I assert that what happens is people get frustrated with, and a, with a leader who doesn't see their potential, maybe someone who doesn't give clear direction, maybe someone who continuously tell, says one thing and does something else. So people don't leave companies, they leave people. And what we are all in, no matter what we do, engineering, construction, doesn't matter. You could be an architect, you could be a draftsman, you could be in the field. It doesn't matter what we do. We are all in the people business, all of us. And so what we have to do is really figure out how do we leverage this to our greatest, uh, our greatest potential. After serving hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of leaders, here's what we found. Having difficult conversations was the least favorite part of their job because they were the least prepared for it, or they didn't know what to do flat out. And think about this in, in terms of your career trajectory. I would assert again, that many of you probably got promoted into jobs, leadership roles, because you were excellent at what you do. But it wasn't because you took some leadership development course in your master's program. It was more because you're, you're an exemplary draftsman or draftswoman, right? You are an unbelievable fill in the blank. And because you were great at that job, they promoted you into a job managing 10 other people who do that work. And, and quite often you might show up to work and because all you have is a hammer, then everyone looks like a nail. So here's how we do this differently. Um, I love this comment too, Brian. Thank you for that. Work is work no matter what you're doing. 
it's almost never fun, but if you enjoy the suffering with people you like, it's tolerable. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I feel like that's a Dilbert cartoon maybe. So let's talk about difficult conversations and how we have these in the 15 to 20 minutes or so that I have left for content, and then we'll move to Q&A. Difficult conversations can spread the realm of all of these, delivering tough news, enforcing policy, developmental feedback, conflicts and disagreements. It can be challenging others on decisions, handling complaints from outside vendors or clients, requesting help, negotiating salaries, negotiating contracts. Um, trust me on this. I've used this. I've used it with my children, right? I have difficult conversations with them on the reg and they know what's coming now, right? When I sit down and I say, hey, the purpose of this conversation with you, and they're like, yep, I know it's next. The goals for the conversation, right? Here's the issue. Here's the rationale. There is a very specific framework that I'm going to share with you. I use with my kids. I use with my spouse. I use with contractors in my home. I've used to buy and negotiate cars before. I use this strategy. So what I'm going to share with you is a strategy that can be pulled out in a moment's notice, spend five minutes on, and it will make the difficult conversation you're about to have that much easier. And I promise you, I'm not overselling it. Okay. So here are the questions that we ask. Right up front, I want to tell you that it is your ability to plan a difficult conversation that will make that conversation easier and easier. They say that for every one minute you plan, you save four. So if you spend 15 minutes planning a difficult conversation, you'll likely save an hour of fretting and worry and thinking through and sleepless nights and heartburn the night before and all of that. And I think we could probably all agree we all probably have at least one difficult conversation to have at some point in our life. We have at least one, probably right now. And we're probably making it bigger than it really needs to be. Many of us have had that situation where we've got to have a difficult conversation. We build it up in our mind and then we go have it. We're like, oh, actually that wasn't that bad, right? Can I get an amen on this? I'm sure some of you folks have had a situation just like this. My grandfather had a great saying, He'd say, let's not pull vault over mouse turds. If I had a high hat, I'd hit it. Let's not pull vault over mouse turds, meaning let's not make the very small things the very big things. And grant some of these difficult conversations can be big, but let's plan it out to make them much, much smaller. Here's how we do that. The first question we ask is, who will be involved? And the reason we need to know this, is there one person? Is there two? Is it a group, right? Is it a sales team? Is it, is it your engineering department? Who will be involved in the conversation? If it's one or two or three, great. List those folks out. Second bullet, what are the communication styles involved, including yourself? Meaning, how do you experience each of those people? Are they warm and slow? Are they cold and fast? Are they cold and slow? How do you experience each one of them? Because if you're dealing with analyticals, then the way we're going to have the conversation is much, much different. If they're expressive, the way we have the conversation is much, much different. So the third bullet is what can you do in advance to make each person more comfortable? Well, here's by and large, the easy rule of thumb. Anyone that is on the left side of the quadrant. So if you are an analytical or you're an amiable, they need to have some time. They need to prep themselves for the conversation. So the best way to make them more comfortable is to let them know it's coming. Hey, I'd like to have a conversation with you tomorrow about what happened in the meeting last week. Nothing big, I just wanna talk through how the client was handled, some expectations I think that were missed and what we can do better next time, right? And I want about 30 to 60 minutes of your schedule to do that, right? And a, an analytical person will actually need to know, well, what was said and how long are we gonna spend on each? And maybe they need to go into the nitty gritty. An amiable person just needs to know, the goal is we're just gonna get resolution on this thing that's an open loop for me, okay? But if you go into an amiable's office and you spring it on them, they may feel blindsided. They may feel like they're being criticized. Um, there may be a negative tension aftermath from not having this correctly. On the right side of the quadrant, just go have it. Drivers, you got a problem with them, tell them. It's not a motive for them. It's just like, what happened? what did I do? Okay, I'll fix it. Awesome. Thanks for telling me. The, the expressives may feel like it's a bit of a critique, so we need to soft shoe a little bit how we have it with them, but we'll talk about that. Last but not least, what signs of tension should you look for? And here's what I mean by that. Excessive fidgeting uh, might be a sign of tension. Somebody who's sweating profusely, sign of tension. You know that red 
thing that comes up someone's neck when they get really inflamed, all the blood's basically rushing to their head and it's coming from their heart. So their neck gets red. That's a sign. One of the signs is arms folded, legs crossed. You're totally shut off from the feedback you're getting, if that's the case. So we need to look for that tension in the middle of these difficult conversations and be able to say, it appears like you're getting maybe worked up or there's some stress over this. Do we need to stick a pin in this conversation until tomorrow, right? It's okay to give people some time in advance. So this, these are the first four questions of the planning process. And again, the PDF document that I'll try and reattach into chat, and if nothing else you'll get as an email attachment, is honestly a reprintable document you can go back to time and time and time again. We've had companies that have actually put these questions on their own letterhead and created them as a peel off sheet so that you can keep it at your desk and have a difficult conversation, do a quick five minute plan before you get in there. Okay. Here is how we have the conversation. And these are bulleted ideas in, in red, right? In bold red. Um, it is the purpose. Goals is under purpose, but purpose and goals are kind of hand in hand. We have rationale or issues. We have ideas. We have actions and we have reactions. Those are our five buckets that we're thinking through. And I don't want you to overthink it. It goes like this. And I'm going to give you a really simple example. Um, because this was present to me not too long ago. My daughter is a sophomore in college. She comes home from time to time. It's sparingly now, uh, which is both makes us incredibly sad and, and uh, um, also excited for her because she doesn't need to come home. But when she comes home, she kind of reverts back to life at college. And she's in a, an apartment with some roommates who maybe don't live as cleanly as we do. And so we had to have a difficult conversation the other day. And my daughter's very expressive right? She, she tends to under stress attack and confront. So here's what I said to her. My daughter's name is Piper. And the way I planned this out was this. I said, Piper, I need to have a conversation with you. And the purpose of my conversation is I want to make sure that expectations are clearly set when you're back home, if even for a week, like it's spring break. Now you'll notice the first bullet is why do you want to have the conversation with them? And, and the what's in it for me, W-I-I-F-M, sounded like this with her. I want to have this because we love having you home. And I want to make sure that while you're here, we are just loving on you. There's no frustration at all. And you're excited to be here. Is that fair? And here's the secret. I use, is that fair a lot? Because when I say what I want, my, my purpose, my goal, it's for the betterment of both of us. Is that fair is an answerable question, typically answerable with yes, right? Here's my goal. At the end of the conversation, we both know what each other expect. And we move forward from this happy as clams that we had the conversation. Does that sound good? And she'll say yes, right? That's purpose. So I'm going to put a pin in that conversation and instead move it to one that you might need to have. Let's say that you have a brand new employee. Maybe they're, maybe they're a millennial or a Gen Z or an al Gen Alpha, somebody that's just new out of school. And they're having a hard time adjusting to the work starts at eight routine, right? Or 730 in some cases. Or maybe it's just making it to meetings on time. Um, another one that's come up quite often is seeing you on video, right? If we're on a Zoom meeting, I really want to see faces. So the purpose of the conversation is that I really want to set some clear expectations about what time the workday starts or the fact that we want to make sure everyone shows up on time for these meetings, okay? Here's the rationale or issues piece. And I'm going to go back to my conversation with Piper. I said, here's the rationale, the issue... Uh, the issue at hand, Piper, is this. You know, one of the things mom and I pride ourselves on is a clean house. We always have. That's how you were raised. And I think your apartment may not be at the level that we would normally live at. And you tend to kind of revert back to that when you come home, which is a little bit of a challenge for us because then we feel like we're picking up after our adult daughter. Does that make sense? And she'd say, yeah, Papa, it does. She calls me Papa all the time. And I said, the issue is that if mom's frustrated, Sometimes she's also angry than at the rest of us. You know what I mean? And even me, I find myself kind of grumbling when I'm putting your dishes in the dishwasher. So here's the benefit of addressing this. If you would just put your dishes straight in the dishwasher, and even from time to time, when you see that green light on, just empty it. Because it, it goes miles and miles with your mom and I when you do that when you're home, right? It's kind of a problem if you just leave dishes and do those things, because then we feel like we're catering to you again. And while we love you and we want you to be here, 
you know, you're an adult person and you're living in these uh, in these parts for a week. And this is what it means to be a good roommate. So I'm just curious, what ideas do you have to solve the problem? And then I put it back to her. Now, this is the key. If you're having a difficult conversation, you own purpose and goals. You own rationale and issues. But when we turn to ideas, it becomes a two-way conversation. So going back to the employee issue at hand, right? Here's the purpose of our conversation. Really need you to show up. My expectation is these meetings start on time. Here's the rationale, the issues behind it. When you and this other person uh, are chronically late to meetings, what it does is it makes everyone feel like their time is not valued. And I know it's not intentional, right? But there's a difference between intent and impact. So while the intention isn't there, the impact is people are a little frustrated. And now I'm hearing the grumblings. And from a cultural perspective, we're an efficient office. We do things by the book. You know, we start on time, we end on time. Those are our level 10 meetings. Um, so it's a problem because it's a challenge for other people to get their minds around why you can't show up to the meeting early. Does that make sense? And now I'm offering it to them. What ideas do you have to really make sure that you can show up to these meetings on time? Now I'm oversimplifying that challenge, that problem. It could be a much bigger, you know, challenging conversation, difficult conversation you need to have. But it really is as simple as doing purpose and goals, rationale or issues, what ideas do you have to solve it? I have some I want to share with you as well. Here are the actions we're going to take. And here's the reactions that may come up. And if we map these out one by one, we spend three, four, five minutes creating our document. This becomes the guiding document that we use to have these difficult conversations. Now, again, I want to share with you a couple of them that I had recently. There was a gentleman who worked for us and he was clearly not a right fit. And it wasn't that he wasn't a great guy. He just wasn't on the right bus. And I sat down and I said, Brent, I have a, I, we need to have a conversation. And Brent was very amiable. And so I said to Brent, hey, buddy, let's go have coffee and let's chat. Because I want to have a conversation with you, but I want it to be you and me, right? Because the amiables, they really want one-on-one, -on -one, mono -in mono type activity. So we go to a coffee shop and I said, I bought him coffee. We sit down and I said, all right, dude, the purpose of our conversation is this. Um, I wanted to have the conversation because I'm not sure you're in the right fit in this role. And my goal at the end of the conversation is, you know, I'm for you, I'm with you, and I will do whatever I can to make you successful. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you know that's where a, a place I'm coming from? And he said, yes, I feel that. And I said, cool, here are the issues at hand. And I went through a series of issues, three of them to be specific where he really needed to step up to the, the task at hand and didn't for whatever reason. And I said, I'm not judging you on that. I just think it's not, it's not in your wheelhouse to do that work. That makes sense. And I said, so I have some ideas. I want to share with you my ideas and I want to hear from you what ideas you have. And so I shared my ideas and I said, number one, I think we find you a right fit job. You're an amazing guy. I will do everything I can to put you in the right place. My second idea is we send you to a coach that figures out what exactly do you want to do within our company? And I will invest money to do that. But I want to know what ideas do you have? And Brent thought for a minute, he shared a couple, he's been thinking about what was on his heart and his mind, um, which he was gracious to share with me and grateful that I created the environment for him to share. And then we said, here are the actions we need to take. And, and, and here's what I know about amiables in particular it will take a fairly long time to get to the decision that they feel great about to move forward. And I said, Brent, as far as actions go, we have 30 days. So we need to get you some coaching sessions. We need to do some searches, but at the end of 30 days, we either need to move you to a different role or we got to move you on. Does that make sense? And he said, yeah, it does. And I said, cool. And I was looking for reactions and the reactions were stress because he gets stressed, he gets a red mark. I was looking for fidgety. I was looking for frustration or I was looking for anger, right? None of those came. It was a super resolved conversation all out of the difficult conversation framework that we were doing here. What is your purpose or goal for having it? What are the rationale or issues at hand? Here are some ideas I have. What ideas do you have? It becomes a conversation. Here are the actions we agree to take and here are the reactions that may happen. And the reaction may be, I am super frustrated we can't finish the conversation yet. We'll have it later. Okay. 
So this is the framework. This is what the document looks like. When you're planning and difficult planning and conducting difficult conversations, we're going to ask four questions just to reiterate. Who's going to be involved? What are the comm styles involved, including yours? What can you do in advance to make the person more comfortable? What signs of tension should you look for? And then fill this out. Hey, the purpose of our conversation is X. My goals for this conversation are one, two, three. What are yours? My rationale or issues at hand are these, one, two, three. Here's the actions I think we need to have, right? What are, what's the reaction going to be and how am I going to deal with that? That's the response strategy. Again, this is a super simple idea, but I don't want the simplicity of this to, to muddy the waters about how effective it is, because this is unbelievably effective, whether you're having a conversation with a spouse or your child or your boss, this thing works. So here's what you got to watch for. Your tone of voice, 90% of it is tone. So when I say, listen, I am with you, I am for you. I want you to be successful. I believe in you. Even for someone that has absolutely dropped the ball, I still believe in them. I want to give them a reputation to live into. So I'm going to start with that. You want to look for loaded words and watch out for this. All, always, you never do this. This is the fusion of absolutes. We want to get rid of that entirely. Falling on one end of the spectrum or other in terms of assertiveness. So we want to make sure that we are not being too passive, too aggressive, or passive aggressive, right? And lastly, a defensive reaction on the other person means, hey, maybe we need to stick a pin in this because cooler heads prevail, okay? So this is what we watch for in the process of having these, but I want you to get really good at just using the framework. Have the conversation with your child tonight about folding their clothes from the laundry and putting them away. That would be a good start. Uh, practice it on your dog for all I care, right? They're, they're a great listener. Um, th the reaction is always going to be the same, right? They're going to love you no matter what, but you're at least practicing, all right? But I want you to practice it because it gets easier and easier and easier. And at some point, you will become the go-to person in a company where folks are saying, you know, give it to Chad, give it to Andrea, give it to Angela, give it to Angie. They're the ones who have great, difficult conversations. They're, they're amazing at it. Have, let them have it, right? And that ultimately will help us improve our career. But by and large, what it does is it, it endears us to the employees that want us to be human with them. So when we're treating others the wish they wish to be treated, and we do it through this platform, it's amazing the result we get on the other side. Okay, I'm going to pause here. We're 10 minutes till... And I just want to go, Brad, we're going to cue you back up here. Um, and I'd love to answer questions if anyone has questions. Uh, I'm going to try and reshare the document just to see if we can get this to everyone. Yep. So as you catch your uh, breath here, I do have uh, a few questions that are, are queued up. Um, so the first question was going back a little bit. Uh, what was the ratio for time saved from prep? By preparing yeah. for the meeting, they what, say, what was Yeah, they say for every one minute you plan, you save four minutes. So if someone has planned even you know 10 minutes for a meeting ahead of time, you'll save 40 minutes of work on the back end of that meeting itself. So for every one minute you plan, you save four. Okay. Uh, and uh, the next question, uh, when you prepare for uh, difficult conversations, do you ever write down verbatim what you'll say? Does referencing notes during the conversation make the message feel disingenuous to the individual? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I'll give you a, a personal example. I needed to have this conversation with my son who's 15 and he was being a 15 year old, you know? I don't know if any of you have 15 year olds, but he was being a 15 year old. And, um, and they're all entitled to be that way from time to time, but he, it was like two days of being that way. And so I literally wrote down the entire framework and I did it verbatim and I had the sheet in front of me and here is the tick here. Here's kind of the answer that I will give to that question, Brad. I think if you are upfront and, and completely transparent with the person you're having that convo with and say, listen, I have some things I really want to say. And I wrote them all down to make sure I have them. So sure. forgive me for reading from this sheet, but I want to make sure these are all covered. 
And even if you're brand new to this and you need to have a difficult conversation, you can say, listen, right up front, I hate having difficult conversations. I'm not great at them. So I want to get that out of the way that I'm going to stumble through this. I just learned this framework to make it easier. So bear with me on it, but, but know that I have our best interest at heart in having this, right? And that transparency makes you human. And it also sort of lets someone else's guard down like, okay, I'll let them fumble through this because I know it's going to be okay once we get to the, you know, the, the heart of the matter. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, another question here. When you talk about what to do to make someone more comfortable for a difficult conversation, can you give some, some other examples? So, you know, you're, you're, you're heading into this meeting, you know, it's going to be a, a, a hard conversation. Um, how do you go about, what are some things that you can do to make the individual, make sure they're comfortable? Yes. This is a great question. I mentioned, you know, amiables and analyticals, we give them advanced notice. That is, that is number one. The one thing you want to do for that group is to say, I'd like to have a conversation with you specifically going back to my example. Uh, specifically, it's about attendance to meetings and making sure that, you know, work is starting on time. Um, and I really want to have a deeper conversation with you about that tomorrow at four o'clock. So that way that person is kind of thinking through it and they don't feel blindsided. There may be some reasons why they're not able to get up early, right? Somebody's going to say, we have a new puppy, I'm not sleeping, or we got a baby at home. Uh, my nights are all mixed up and I'm trying to take it from, you know, from my spouse and so on and so forth. So it's okay. Give them, give them some room. The second thing I would say in terms of, of how we prep people is an understanding that sometimes unsolicited feedback feels like criticism. And that, by the way, this is great marriage advice too, by the way. So uh, unsolicited <laughs> feedback feels like criticism. And so one of the things that you can say to someone to make them you know, more at ease is, first of all, are you at a place where you're open to feedback? And, and, or can I give you some feedback right now? Unfiltered. And when you're asking someone, can I give you some unfiltered feedback? Or are you at a place where you can take some feedback? If you, if you have built a relationship enough with your team that you can ask them that and they feel comfortable saying, no, I'm not mentally, I'm, I'm not at a place where sure. you can give me feedback right now. You're a great, you're in a great leadership spot. If you have not built that with your team, you're going to want to make sure that you do, which just means they have psychological safety with you, right? That, that it's okay to say things stink at home or, or. I'm stressed to the gills with work right now. And you as a leader can say, I get that. I want to be appreciative and understanding that. How can we work through it? Um, so so the, the, the note I would take or leave for you all is this, that you want to ask for the ability to give feedback in this difficult conversation. And that this is, a, this is obviously a proactive difficult conversation. And there are reactive scenarios as well that require a different framework. Um, you know, when we're, when we're reacting, when we're getting uh, a difficult conversation thrown at us, what we have to do is deescalate. Okay. So what I hear you saying is this, is there anything else that's bothering you? What else is on your mind? So they share and share and share. Okay, great. So I heard this and this, tell me more about that. Is there anything else that's bothering you? And, and every time we deescalate, a lot of times people are coming to you and they're frustrated, but they just want to empty their bucket. They just want to like let the air out of the balloon, you know? And once they do that, now we can have a conversation. Okay. If we were to solve one of those right now, which one is most important? And then we get to what it is, right? So case in point, there was a company that we did some work with and, and the woman was really frustrated because her sweet mate or someone who shared a, a cubicle across the way from her uh, was clipping her fingernails in the middle of the day into a wastebasket. And this person thought it was completely unprofessional and it shouldn't be done in the work environment. And, and she said, and furthermore, she does this and this and this and doesn't value people's time and yada, yada, yada. And I said, okay, so if we're going to solve one thing, what is it? And she goes, she can't clip her fingernails anymore. And that was it. Like once, <laughs> once the person stops clipping your fingernails, then that's it. But it was a very reactive. It was a very reactive uh, response. And our goal was just to deescalate everything 
and then handle the one thing that we did, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got some other uh, great questions here. Um, the next one, we conduct most of our challenging conversations via Zoom, as I'm sure a lot of people are probably experiencing in, in, today's, new, in today's new world. So uh, anything that you'd want to say to coach for success in that situation? So I'll just I'll add on, basically just sort of the difference between in-person, inevitably it's going to be harder to read maybe some of those signs of stress um, and such. But yeah, what uh, uh, as far as coaching someone to, to have success via Zoom, and challenging conversations. Um, <laughs> yeah, I saw a post the other day. It said um, someone was conducting a meeting or something, and they said, uh, "Hey, we really appreciate your participation in the meeting, but we will ask you that you turn your video off because your face, your reaction is showing everything to the entire group." <laughs> Which basically about the person like grimacing and making faces at people who are commenting in the meeting. And so I'll, I say that jokingly, I think it's important to be face to face if you can, to have these difficult conversations. Um, you know, firings are never easy if that's the difficult conversation to have, but typically it's best to, to go right to the heart of the matter. And I find it to be more of a personal um, approach when we are face to face. Some people may not. So, you know, again, to, to, to coach or counsel people that are having these on Zoom, if you're if you're having a developmental or a disciplinary conversation, in my mind, unless HR needs to be on the line, it really ought to be one to one. And if HR needs to be on the line, HR can maybe come in and say, "Hey, I'm just here. I'm recording this for you know the purpose of having two people on the line, but I'm going to turn my video off." And that way, it's just leader and direct report having it. It doesn't feel like I'm getting ganged up on on Zoom, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Here's another another really good question. Um, how do you react to a leader who does not follow this framework towards you? So again, I'll just add my little twist to it. So yeah, it's it's you find yourself in in a situation where it's a hard conversation. Someone's maybe coming at you with some critical feedback or or, or such. How are you, are we able to, or would you be able to sort of flip this and use some of this framework to get gain control and make it more of a productive conversation? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, here's, what's amazing about the framework is that idea of like purpose goals, issues, and rationale, uh, act or ideas, action items, reaction. If you go through that and you're filling that bucket as someone is sharing with you. So Brad, let's say you come at me and you've got you're, you've got some, you know, some feedback to give me off your chest. Which I do all the time. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. And I love that. Uh, I love that about you. Uh, and you're very, you're very direct and it's typically developmental. Um, but, but if, if I'm thinking, okay, so what I'm hearing is the purpose of this conversation is da, 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 right. I might restate it back to you. Did I get that right? Like the whole point of this was that you can give me clarity on what your expectations are. And I heard this, this, and this. Is that right? Cool. So my goal leaving here is this, from what I'm hearing you say. And then, can you give me some some issues or or, or you know times when this has occurred, just so I know, and can be aware of it, right? So you're essentially eliciting the responses that you would normally plan for in your difficult conversation. And here's the way I would recommend people approach this: is take it all in, right? Take it all in as feedback and wait to have the difficult conversation with them, you know, around things that you'd like to chat with them about until you've thought through everything. Because if this is direct report to, or leader to direct report, and you need to go work on some things, go work on those things for a week or 10 days, and then come back to leader and say, hey, could I schedule a follow-up meeting with you? And then go through the purpose of this meeting is this, my goals are this, the issues, the rationale, et cetera. If you feel like you need to, you know, maybe lead up the chain a little bit. Like, hey, the purpose of this meeting is I really want to clarify some of my expectations of you as my leader. And my goal on this is that we both get like extreme productivity out of our meetings, but I'm missing a few things from you. And I just love to get clarity on those. So I have some ideas. I'd love to hear your ideas. And then I want to figure out what actions we can take to make that happen. Does that sound fair? And if I said that to you as a leader, you'd be like, awesome, let's go. Right. Yep. Yep. And as the, 
employee go, that's how the meeting was supposed to be run. <laughs> right? Drop the mic, walk yeah, out, yeah. drop the mic. Yeah, go on. Uh, um, <clears throat> what about, uh, there was an inquiry, um, what can you do as a slow processor if the ideas portion of the conversation they put forth and they, if they put forth an option that is unreasonable yep. for you or the company? Yep. Um, it, this is such a good question because people who are cerebral and that need to think, thinking is really critical for them because it's not like expressives, as an example, can come up with ideas off the top of their head. That's how they're wired. But, but an analytical or an amiable may say, I, I just need some time to process that. I don't know yet, right? And so it's, it's perfectly okay to say, I would love to share with you some ideas, but I actually need a day or two to, to come up with those and document them for you. Could I get that, yeah. right? And, and as a leader, you know, a driver might say, you got till the end of the day, I need to know today. And you may have to work with that. But if the driver is understanding and maybe able and willing to flex and you say, could I get until the end of the day tomorrow or Friday? Um, you know, then they'll, they may be more amenable to that. So perfectly fine. Just to say, I need some time to think through that. Yeah. Right? Just to be fair, I'm a processor. I need to think through it, but I promise yeah. you I'll, I'll put time into this tonight. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um, a couple more here. Um, and then, uh, and your cutoff is around 12:15, Adam. So we've got about yep. so, okay. So, uh, how do you go about prioritizing these conversations in our very busy and demanding work lives? What strategies do you utilize to keep these conversations front of mind? Well, you know, I mentioned level 10, and I, I assume that there's a number of people on the call that are uh, EOS uh companies they're using the entrepreneurial operating system level 10 meetings the book traction from gina whitman um you know one of the things that 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 platform that methodology inspires people to do is always be able to bring up issues so the issues are constantly being brought forth and then we we deal with them in those level 10s we you know we identify discuss and solve each of those so in reality, we could or should be having these difficult conversations regularly and regularly could be once a month. It could be every six months. It all depends on you and your team. Um, candidly, for what it's worth, I like to call these clarity and alignment meetings because it's like we need to have a difficult conversation versus, hey, we need to have a clarity and alignment meeting. Everyone's after clarity and alignment. I mean, we, we talked about this in the first webinar was, Clarity, alignment, purpose. That's what people want in their world. And so if you're having a clarity and alignment meeting, all it means is there may be a lack of clarity or misalignment between team to team or leader to direct report. So clarity and alignment meetings, have them all the time. Um, and, and, and it candidly, this could be five minutes. So when you fill out your document, you might have this difficult conversation, quote unquote, uh, or the clarity and alignment conversation with someone on the way to the coffee shop, right? It could be it, 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 at the end of tail end of a meeting. Hey, do you mind staying on Zoom for five minutes? I just want to have a quick clarity and alignment meeting with you, and then walk through that document. So I don't want anyone to to leave here thinking this has to be sixty minutes or thirty minutes long. It may be if it's a big enough challenge, right, or issue at hand. But if sure. this is corrective behavior or clarity and alignment purposes, it could be a very brief conversation. Okay, good. We got two more questions. So you got two minutes for each one, and then we'll do a one minute wrap up here and we'll get everyone back to Love their it. busy days here. Um, much of this class is about difficult conversations with team members. Um, is it possible to apply this, uh, well, the way this question was stated, what about difficult conversations with clients? Can, can, mm. can we take the same format and adjust it for a client conversation, a difficult yeah, client conversation? hundred percent. And, and ultimately I believe, well, two things. Number one, if you're saying we need to have a difficult conversation with a client, quite often there's one of two ways these are occurring. The client's coming in hot and we need to deescalate. So we use that process. Um, and number two, we screwed up or we delayed, something's delayed and we're not gonna get a project done and we gotta go deliver bad news. Ultimately, both of those, what's happening is expectations 
are at stake. And if we can clarify expectations, then typically we can we can move forward, um, you know, in a peaceful way. We can resolve this easily. Um, but those expectations are are. I, I'm going to tease next month's session. That's really about next month when we talk about how do you how do you create crystal clear expectations of your team, of your clients, of your families, because when we're all clear on expectations, um, wow, there's a whole lot of frustration that's avoided. And, and I think by and large, most people just want to know what are the expectations of me? Um, so yes, is a short answer to, to the question, okay. uh, which I made very long. You can use this for client calls. You may just have to tweak a thing or two in the midst yep. of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, you know, what the, the, as far as the next session, setting clear, crystal clear expectations and getting others excited about it. That was, yes. you know, the, the, the one thing that, that, uh, I've, uh, you and I visited on that and, and I love that concept. It's, you know, rather than just pushing it out there, it's also getting buy-in from them and getting individuals, both clients, employees, et cetera, excited about it. All right. One more quick one here, and then we'll wrap up. How do we mitigate if someone above you takes a simple question, is that fair as me being condescending? Does mm. that get mitigated simply by watching your tone or you maybe change your language a little bit or, you know, what is, what is the potential risk there? Yeah, that's a good question. And I could see how some, to some people that may, sure. may come off as condescending. Um, it, in all honesty, take it out of your repertoire if it doesn't work for you. For me, I often ask it because I want to make sure that, that uh, I, I let me take a step back. When I typically ask it, I will set the stage first. Hey, I want you to know I'm for you. I'm with you. Like I, I, I believe in your ability to be successful in this industry. This is what I'm after. So I want you to know the context that I'm coming from is, is uh, generative, right? Like it's, it's uh, there's an idea that we can both grow from this. Is that fair? And they'll be like, oh yeah, totally. So I'm asking it almost like just to get agreement versus seeming like I'm trying to get the upper hand, which I'm really not. Um, sure. But yeah, I would just pull that out of your repertoire. If is that fair? seems like you're trying to be condescending. Yeah. Um, Could you even just yeah. change the language a little bit? Like say, for example, I just, I just sense that, you know what, if I said, does that seem reasonable is going to be you know, more acceptable to you than maybe I interject yes. that instead of. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. I love that. Yep. Good. Yeah. Um, well, fantastic. Um, great questions. Uh, great attendance. Uh, we peaked upwards of, of, I think, 60 participants. Thank you all uh, for joining us today. Uh, if you did miss the initial um, uh, intro part, there are five remaining sessions. We would love to see people pre-register for those. Uh, we'll be sending a link out in order to do so. Um, if you had, you know, like I said, one takeaway, or if it inspires you to continue your growth as a leader, please consider joining us for the remaining sessions. Absolutely love to have you. The more, the merrier. Uh, great questions posed today. Um, of course, you know, one more pitch, uh, coniknetwork.com. If you are in the technical field, if there's anything that we can do to help on the recruiting, uh, if you just want feedback on what we're seeing out there in the labor market, feel free to reach out to us. If you have questions that come up after the fact, or as you go to implement this process, this structure, um, feel free to ping myself or Adam um we'll get the, the your your questions answered so i hope to see a lot of you again uh next month and uh anything else any closing words adam otherwise we'll, we'll let everyone get back to their day yeah the only thing i would add uh remember the platinum rule you know treat others the way the wish why is it such a tongue twister for me <laughs> treat others the way they wish to be treated right i think that's the new rule moving forward so appreciate everyone's attendance and again, we will um, we'll have the recording out and all the supporting documents very, very soon. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.